So this is AP Chemistry Lesson 4 and we're going to uh, discuss uh, the basic atom. So electrical force is the single most important factor in chemistry. The key point about electrical force is positive attracts negative and negative attracts positive. Positive repels pushes away positive and negative repels that pushes away negative. That seems so simple and yet it's at the center of everything we talk about in chemistry. Is this attraction between positive and negative, between opposite charges, and the repulsion between like charges, positive positive or negative negative. An element is pure matter that cannot be divided into simpler substances. There are 90 naturally occurring elements plus about another 28 that were created by scientists in labs. All matter in the universe is made of these 90 elements. Below are five naturally occurring elements. Carbon. Carbon has many forms. Uh, that is in the form of uh, uh, possibly uh, coal, whereas it could also be diamond or it could be the graphite that you use in your pencil. Then there's gold. And gold has many industrial uses as well as just being a commodity for storing people's wealth that people use to preserve their wealth. Uh, it's used for a number of industrial purposes. Uh, neon. Neon is often used for lighting. It's a gas. It's one of the noble gases. Uranium is the largest naturally occurring element in the universe as far as anyone knows. Anything above uranium is not naturally occurring. It's unstable and won't stay together. And uranium can be used for nuclear energy. And mercury. Mercury is the only metal that's actually a liquid at room temperature. You can take a steel ball and put it on liquid mercury and it will float. Because mercury is more dense than steel. So just as the 26 letters of the English language can be arranged to make millions of words, the 90 elements can be arranged and combined to make millions of different substances and compounds. So a compound is a substance containing two or more elements. And there are up to 50 million chemical substances, and I've read all kinds of numbers, but there's millions and millions that are made out of just about 90 elements. So if you can combine 90 elements in a lot of different ways, you can make 50 million compounds. However, uh, you can't just simply throw elements together and expect them to form some new compound. Just as you don't randomly throw letters together in the English language and expect them to actually spell a word. There are rules that you have to follow about how words are spelled, about how sentences are formed, and the same thing is true in chemistry. Water consisting of the elements hydrogen and oxygen is the most common compound on Earth. Oxygen is the most common element on Earth, and hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. 74%, three-fourths of the entire universe is made up of hydrogen. The periodic table is a list of all elements in the universe. The periodic table is the centerpiece of the study of chemistry. I always say it's the most amazing document in all of human history because it lists every pure substance in the entire universe. And how we know that we'll talk about at a later time. But they're all, they all fit on a, basically a single piece of paper, every single element that's in the universe. There's nothing out there uh, that we don't know about that could be on this table. So Dmitry Mendeleev is credited with creating the periodic table and he did much of his work by laying out cards while he was riding trains around Russia. It was almost like he was playing a card game like solitaire. He was just laying out cards and trying to see how they fit together, how they arrange together, like putting together pieces of a puzzle. The two main divisions of the periodic table are the metals, which are the alkali, alkaline earth metals, which are the ones on the, over on the far left, those two columns on the far left. Also the transition metals, that's the light blue. That's the large section of the periodic table and it lies right in the middle. Sometimes uh, I refer to it as the valley because it forms a valley in the periodic table. You're going to learn in this class why the periodic table is shaped the way it is, why it's late, not only the, the order of the elements, but why it has this kind of unusual shape. Nonmetals. Nonmetals uh, are over on the right side. They're the ones in orange. 
Also, the ones that are called halogens, group 7A, those are also nonmetals. But they're so special that they kind of give them their own name, halogens, because they have a lot of special reactive properties. Um, and then metalloids are kind of like the border between metals and nonmetals. So metals are the largest part of the periodic table. It's everything from that purple section called other metals all the way over to the far left hand side alkali metals. Those are all metals. Then the nonmetals are a much smaller group, but they're a very important group because your body is mainly made up of nonmetals. Living organisms are made up of nonmetals. Uh, and that includes what's labeled there as nonmetals and halogens. And then noble gases are also nonmetals. However, they're generally viewed as kind of their own group uh, because they do have special properties as well. So the metalloids in light green are the border between metals and nonmetals. And they're sometimes called semi-metals. You see some alternate names down there on the bottom of the screen. So for metalloids, it's semi-metals. Um, and they are kind of the border because they have kind of properties of metals, but also some properties of nonmetals. Metalloids are what are used in semiconductors that you hear about in computers such as silicon and germanium. Now, up at the top, you'll see it says representative groups, group A. We're going to get into a very important concept in the near future called valence electrons. These are the outermost electrons in an atom. And only the A elements, that is the first and second columns, the alkali, alkaline earth, um, and the A elements over on the right, the last six columns. So the first two columns and the last six columns, those are the only areas that contribute valence electrons. Transition metals do not contribute valence electrons to a typical chemical bond. They do to metallic bonding, but not to a typical chemical bond. So the representative elements are the first two columns and the last six columns of the periodic table. In about 400 BC, a Greek named Democritus developed the idea that there was a smallest piece of matter that could not be further divided. The Greek word atomos means indivisible, cannot be divided. And the smallest piece of an element is called an atom. In other words, the Greeks kind of argued philosophically because they, did, because they didn't have a way to do experiments. If you took a piece of gold, for example, and you cut it in half, and then you took a piece of that and you cut it in half, and then you took a piece of that and you, cut, and you kept doing that, could you cut a piece of gold in, in, to infinity uh, forever? You could always have a smaller and smaller and smaller piece of gold. And it was just a philosophical debate back then, as I said, because they didn't have a way to test this. But some, some of the Greeks said, yes, you can cut it forever, theoretically at least, if you had a knife that was small enough. Others said, no, there's going to be a smallest piece of gold, uh, beyond which if you cut it again, it will no longer be gold. And we now know that that is correct, and that's what an atom is. It's the smallest piece of any pure element. In about 1800, English chemist John Dalton developed his atomic theory describing atoms and how they combine to form compounds. The first postulate of Dalton was all elements are comprised of indivisible atoms. Two, atoms of the same element are identical. Atoms of one element are different from those of another element. Atoms of different elements can combine in whole number ratios to form compounds combination of two or more elements. We talked about that earlier. And four, chemical reactions are when atoms join, separate, or, re or are rearranged. Atoms of one element cannot be changed into another element. So these were really foundational principles of chemistry. Generally speaking, they're correct, but let's talk about some of the qualifications and conditions. Dalton did all of this before we knew of something that you're going to, we're going to talk about today called protons, neutrons, and electrons, the components that make up an atom. He didn't know about those when he wrote these principles, and yet they're, they're, very, they're very accurate. Okay, so the following are some notes concerning Dalton's four principles. First, all elements are composed of indivisible atoms. Well, Dalton developed these four postulates 100 years before the discovery of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Those will be discussed in just a moment. Dalton is correct that atoms cannot be divided into simpler substances. However, they can be split and broken into their 
component protons, neutrons, and electrons. Atoms of the same element are identical. Atoms of one element are different from those of another element. That second sentence is absolutely true. The first one, Dalton did not know the concept of ions and isotopes, and again, we're going to discuss those at a later time. But that's a, those are both ways in which the atoms of the same element can be different from one another. Okay, so on uh, a couple of note, more notes on Dalton's four principles. Three, atoms of different elements can combine in whole number ratios to form compounds. That's combinations of two or more elements. This is completely correct. An atom cannot be divided. This is why it's possible to have H2O but not H1.5O. So they have to be in whole number ratios. Four, chemical reactions are when atoms join, separate, or are rearranged. Atoms of one element cannot be changed into another element. Well, that first sentence is absolutely correct. In fact, it's the definition of chemistry. Uh, rearrangements of atoms is the definition of chemical reactions. Atoms can, however, be changed into other elements. This occurs during nuclear reactions, which involve changes in the nucleus. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in this lesson. An atom is the smallest piece of an element there is. If you cut an atom of gold or iron in half, you will no longer have gold or iron. An atom consists of three parts. Protons, which are positively charged. Neutrons, which have no charge, they're neutral. And electrons, which are negatively charged. A lot of students at first wonder, what does it mean positive, negative? Is, some, is negative somehow inferior to positive? It's not. It's just a way of saying opposite. You could call it the yes and no charge, or the red and blue charge, or um, the up and down charge. It just means that they're opposites of each other. So for protons and electrons, as we'll see, the charges are equal, but they're opposite, and that makes them attract each other. Why they attract each other is one of the mysteries of the universe, just as gravity, why gravity pulls, pulls us down to the earth, is kind of a mystery of the universe that nobody can fully explain. So let's look at the structure of a, of a basic Bohr atom. A hundred years ago, this was the most advanced model of an atom. Now it's kind of a simplified version that we use to study. And we can, do a, we can study a lot about chemistry and about atoms uh, and chemistry in general with this simplified model of the atom. So the center of the atom is called the nucleus. Uh, unlike the nucleus that you learned about in biology in a cell, it's not a pouch. It doesn't have a wall around it. It's just simply a name for the center of the atom. Orbitals, also called shells, are energy levels where electrons move around the nucleus. You can think of them like steps on a, on a, on a ladder. Uh, electrons have to be on one of the steps. They can't be in between steps, just as you can't stand in between steps on a ladder. Yeah, you, you have to be on the lower step or a higher step, but you can't be in between. Energy levels are that same way. Why that is, is not something you need to really understand for this class. Why the energy, that's really advanced chemistry. But um, we'll study a little bit about it and why these energy levels and how they work. So in the nucleus, you have protons. Those are positively charged particles. And you have neutrons. Those are uh, neutral particles. Uh, they have no charge to them. What the neutrons do, the protons have a special force called the strong nuclear force, which holds them together. We just, we just learned that positive charges should repel each other. So the question is, why don't the protons push apart from each other? Why don't they just fly apart and break up the nucleus? And that's because they have hooks on them. These hooks are really strong. They're much stronger than the electromagnetic force that pushes them apart. And if you can push the protons together hard enough, such as in the center of a star where there's millions of degrees and there's a lot of energy to push them together, they'll hook together. And those hooks will hold them together even though they're their electromagnetic force wants to push them apart. The hooks are much stronger. Neutrons also have those hooks, but they have them without having the repulsive positive um, charge. So they don't push the protons away, and yet they do hook onto them in the same way through the strong nuclear force. So neutrons serve to stabilize the nucleus by helping the protons to stay together. And then there's electrons. Electrons are negatively charged particles that circle the nucleus. 
Why do they circle the nucleus? Because they're attracted by the protons. They have a lot of energy. They don't just fly into the nucleus, but they tend to circle it in these energy levels. But um, they do have the same charge as a proton. It's just the opposite charge. So they're attracted to protons, and that's why electrons don't just fly away into space. So a valence orbital is the outer orbital of an atom. This is a very important term to know. Because helium has only one orbital, that's the valence orbital. Valence electrons are the electrons in the valence orbital. It is the valence electrons that form chemical bonds to be discussed later. Really at the heart of chemistry is chemical bonds. It's atoms connecting with other atoms to form new compounds, those 50 million substances. And it's the valence electrons, they're kind of on the front line. They're the ones that contact other atoms. So that's where the action is. It's in the valence electrons. And so it's very important to understand that concept of valence. It means outer. Uh, in this case, there's only one orbital, so the outer orbital is the first orbital. But you'll see in other, orbi uh, other atoms and elements, there's two, three, four, five, six orbitals. And the valence electrons will be whichever the outer, the electrons in whichever is the outer orbital. Okay, so let's look at the proton. A proton is the positively charged part of an atom. You don't need to understand what positive means other than it is the opposite of a negative charge. A proton has a mass of about 1.6 times 10 to the minus 22nd to 7 kilograms. It's not really an important fact, but what you should know is it's much more massive than an electron. It's about 1,836 times more massive than an electron. So electrons and protons have equal and opposite charges. The strength of their charges is equal but opposite. However, the mass of a proton is much, much greater than the mass of an electron. A proton has a charge of 1.062 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It's a very small amount of charge, which is a number we'll rarely use. We really don't use that number. And more commonly, we assign a charge of plus 1 and a mass of 1. That's one atomic mass unit to a proton. Uh, basically, that's how an atomic mass unit was defined. It's basically the mass of a proton. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and you just say a proton has a plus 1 charge. Protons contain the strong nuclear force, which holds them together in the nucleus against the repulsion of the electromagnetic force. So we talked about that just a minute ago. An electron is the negatively charged part of an atom. An electron has a negative charge equal and opposite uh, to that of a proton, which is the same number, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. An electron has a mass, and there it is. It's a very tiny mass, but we talked about it, uh, the, uh, how much more massive the proton is. Again, this is not a really important number, except a few experiments where we'll talk about um, the, the mass of protons, but it's very, very rarely discussed. An electron moves outside of the nucleus in specified energy levels called orbitals. Okay, neutron. A neutron is a part of an atom that has no charge. In the simplest sense, a neutron is made up of a proton and an electron, a positive and negative charge, and they neutralize each other. A neutron has a mass, as you can see. This is slightly more than the mass of a proton, but not exactly equal to the mass of a proton and an electron added together. It's not a terribly important fact. In chemistry, we assign a charge of zero and a mass of one to a neutron. Neutrons contain the strong nuclear force which holds protons together in the nucleus against the electromagnetic force. So it has those hooks that I was speaking of, as do the protons to hold together the nucleus. Okay, so we're going to conclude this lesson by talking about chemical reactions, physical changes, and nuclear reactions. Chemical reactions create new substances by rearranging atoms into new compounds through a chemical reaction. So for example, two hydrogen molecules. Uh, water is comprised of two uh, molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen. And when they combine, the molecules of hydrogen break apart, as does the molecule of oxygen, and they recombine to form water, H2O. So a chemical change occurs when the atoms combine to form a structure called a molecule, a water molecule in this case. Chemical reactions are really the centerpiece of uh, chemistry of what we're going to be talking about all semester in this class. So it's exactly what Dalton said. It's, it's a rearrangement of atoms. 
and they form new compounds, just like putting letters in the alphabet together to form new words. Because water is made up of more than one different kind of element, it is referred to as a compound. So there's an example of what's, what, that chemical, what that chemical equation means. The H2, the H small 2, means a hydrogen molecule. It's two hydrogen atoms stuck together. In nature, hydrogen atoms always stick together in pairs like that. You'll never find just a hydrogen atom floating around in the atmosphere. So they always pair up. We'll talk about that concept later. And now what the big two in front of the H is saying is that there's two of those. You have two hydrogen molecules. Then you go over to oxygen. O2 is the same thing. O small 2 means you have two oxygen atoms. The oxygen that we breathe is O2. It's not just oxygen atoms. It's a molecule of oxygen. It's two oxygen atoms put together. Now, when they react, they all break apart. The hydrogens break apart, those two hydrogen molecules break apart, the oxygen molecule breaks apart, and they rearrange so that two of the hydrogens are attached to an oxygen, and the other two hydrogens are attached to the other oxygen to form water. You'll notice that you have the same number of hydrogen on both sides of the arrow, four, and the same number of oxygen on both sides of the arrow, two. Okay, so again, this is worth repeating. Chemical reactions create new substances by rearranging atoms into new compounds through a chemical reaction. Again, just like letters of the alphabet can be arranged and rearranged in different ways to form different words. Water is made of two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule to form a new substance called water, H2O. The way water reacts with your body is totally different than the way pure oxygen and pure hydrogen react with your body. So if you drank liquid hydrogen or liquid oxygen, you would die. Um, it doesn't react, just putting them together like that artificially, just pouring them together in your body doesn't work. Uh, you have to actually have a chemical reaction that changes them into water. So water reacts very positively with your body. As you know, your body needs water in order for you to live. But it doesn't need hydrogen molecules and it doesn't need oxygen molecules. So they do react totally differently. That's the key of a chemical reaction. It produces a new substance that has different properties. Uh, different chemical properties. Physical changes determine whether a particular substance is a solid, liquid, or gas form. These are called states or phases of matter. So there are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. The word gas in this context doesn't mean gas as in gasoline like people buy at the gas station. That's just the name of a chemical compound that people put in their car. Gas means molecules that are unattached. We'll talk about that right now. Like air, for example, is a gas. But other things can be, many, many um, compounds can be either solid, liquid, or gas, depending on the temperature and the pressure. So solids are molecules held firmly together. In the case of water, we call this ice. So frozen water, where the molecules are tightly held together, is ice. And what that requires is a very low temperature so that the molecules don't have a lot of energy to move apart. Then if you put some heat into it, the molecules touch but can move around one another. So liquid water splashes around. So liquid water, the molecules are touching, but they're touching loosely. They stay in contact with each other, but they can move around and that's why water sloshes around in a glass. And finally, gas. Molecules have enough energy to separate from each other and move upward against gravity. So that would be steam. If you boiled some water, or simply if water, you left a cup of water out in the room and it evaporated, that would be the case of water being gas. The key here is, though, between a physical and a chemical change. The last slide we talked about chemical changes, how hydrogen and oxygen are different than water that they create. They have different chemical properties. Here, solid water called ice, liquid water, and gas version of water called steam or vapor, they would all react in your body the same. They're still H2O. They are still the same chemical compound. So your body would react to all three of those states of matter the same way. Uh, it's just all states of matter has to do with is whether the molecules stick together or not. That's basically what it comes down to and how tightly they stick together. 
And finally, we'll touch on a subject that used to be part of the AP exam. It's not anymore, but we'll touch, touch on it and maybe a little bit more later on if we have time. A nuclear reaction is one where the, the, where the number of protons or neutrons is changed. So it's something that changes the nucleus. Number of protons changes. Elements are defined by the number of protons they have. Hydrogen must have one proton. Helium must have two protons. Carbon must have six protons. If it has any different number, those elements have any different number of protons uh, than they're supposed to have, they won't be the same element. They've switched them into a new element. So elements, the elements are defined by the number of protons, not the number of neutrons or electrons. So if a proton is added or removed from an oxygen atom, the atom will no longer be oxygen. Now in, pra in practical terms, you can't really remove a proton from, from oxygen, but you can from some more unstable uh, elements that are radioactive, that would be like uranium, you can add and subtract protons from some of the larger elements. They'll a little bit more easily give up their protons or neutrons and that makes them uh, susceptible to nuclear reactions. So number of neutrons change. The number of neutrons in two atoms of the same element can be different. These are called isotopes. We'll talk about that in a later lesson. Carbon has six protons. Most carbon atoms also have six neutrons, but some have seven or eight neutrons. These different atoms are isotopes of carbon. So in this sense, Dalton wasn't right in that correct in that all atoms of the same element are exactly the same. They can have differences uh, in terms of number of neutrons. But generally speaking, a nuclear reaction is one that involves changing the nucleus. A chemical reaction is one that takes atoms that are unchanged and puts them together to form new compounds. And a physical reaction is just the same substance, water for example, is it sticking together tightly to form ice, is it sloshing around to form liquid water, or is it boiling in, in, on your stove to form vapor or gaseous water. That's the difference between these three types of reactions. Okay, so that takes care of this. We'll continue to study the atom in our next lesson. Go ahead and answer the assignment uh, for this lesson. And um, we're going to try to move through nine lessons. This is number four uh, in the next week or so. And um, we will uh, get the next one tomorrow. All right, so you have a good day.